Amen. Thanks, guys. Well, good morning, everybody. What a what a blessed a blessed day. It's a Labor Day weekend. This is a, everybody's last opportunity to go and celebrate labor. It's always been interesting to me that nobody labors on Labor Day, but it's great to great to see all of y'all today. I just want to we want to welcome. Uh, a new person here, and that's uh, Chris, you know, he's, he went to the Philippines and brought his wife to be home. They're being married in two weeks, and so you guys, uh, you get more response than I do when I'm preaching, so I just, uh, uh, why don't you stand up so everybody can get a, a good look at you. Amen. And uh, Terence, Terence, would you come up here right quick? I want you to share a little word of testimony. We're so happy that uh, Helen is here. We've heard so much about her, and we're just really excited about it. I just saw him walking out. I didn't want you to go. I want you to, is he, couldn't I get a microphone? Um, he, he doesn't have to come up. We stay right there. Just tell us what God's done for you. Yeah, we were in prayer and fasting this week, and one night he came in and gave us this praise report. It's really great. Um, well, only a few people knew that I had kidney failure and I was about to be on dialysis. Uh, Kenneth took me to the doctor on Wednesday and I've been taking, started taking this supplement called Kidney Restore just, just to see what would happen. Uh, so on Thursday, I got a call from the doctor stating that my kidneys are back into normal range and I'm not uh, going to have dialysis. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's good. That's good. That's good. Well, that's a good praise report. <laughs> I'll tell you what, when the Lord reverses something that serious, how many of you believe God answers prayer? Woo. You know... There could be a lot of reasons for this, but um, we just give all the glory to God. You know, somebody got into a car wreck and just demolished their car, and they were okay, and they were giving God praise for it. And somebody said, well, how do you know the Lord did it? I said, well, uh, I'm not too terribly sure, but uh, I, I give him all the praise anyway. <laughs> it's good to be alive, right? Today we're starting uh, a new series. We're just going to go to a chapter in the New Testament, the fourth chapter of Ephesians. And uh, we're going to, in the next four or five weeks, we're just going to walk through this uh, passage or this chapter and um, Something that uh, this week we, we just really sense that God has a call upon us. And I want to talk to us a little bit about that, about that calling that, that we, we do have uh, today. So I want to talk about the calling of the people of God, the calling of God's children. What, what has God called us to? What is the primary call? Ephesians, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with one another, with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. Father, we just thank you for your word. Sometimes it's just great power in reading your word and listening to your word and allowing your word to speak to us. But I pray that in these next few minutes we have together, you'll give to me uh, the right words to say and give us ears to hear 
uh, your word today. We give you the praise for it. Everybody said amen. Well, I want to talk about four things. I want to talk about the call to unity, the character of unity, the work of unity, and the power of unity. In these first three chapters, Paul unfolds the eternal purpose of God working throughout history. Through Jesus, who died for us and raised him from the dead, God is uh, created. He has created something new, a new community, new people, new life for new individuals, and a new community. We call it church, the body of Christ. And he's also, um, he's also has reached out to an alienated world an alienated humanity, and that humanity is being reconciled to him. Fractured humanity being united. Magnificent vision that he lays out. I know we see a lot of things uh, going on right now, and sometimes we wonder, you know, uh, how can all of this be? But how many of you know that behind the scenes, God is working? And sometime in the scenes, God is working. We see him working. But we understand that God is at work, and we thank God for it. So now he moves, though, in the fourth chapter to this new community. What are the behavior of of this new community? What are the new norms that we should experience as the, the people of God? So he goes from an exposition really into an exhortation. And the first thing he talks about is this call that is upon us, the call to unity. He said, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. So he, he's pleading. He said, I'm, I'm begging you. This is a solemn request. Uh, he's incarcerated, so there's a double entendre here when he says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, I'm a prisoner of Christ, and I am a prisoner because of Christ. And there's not much that I can do to make change in you and to augment change except these uh, passionate words that I'm writing down and I'm sending to you. He felt, I'm sure, uh, just uh, he'd love to be with them and couldn't be with them. He'd love to be with them. And, but he cries out, cries out for a cause. The only instrument he has is the pen. He says, I'm begging for you to walk worthy of the calling. There's something that really strikes me in this passage, and I think that we should also acknowledge this in all of the Scripture, especially those words that are given to us as the church. Many times we look at Scripture from a personal standpoint, our individual application. And I've used this a whole lot, walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, Uh, like live up to the capacity, Uh, live on a level commensurate with the call that God has put upon your life. But interestingly, he's saying this to the church. He's saying this to all of us. He said, because when God speaks many times, He speaks to us as a unit, all of us. That's why unity is so vital, that we hear the Lord together. I'll tell you, this week, renewal week, this week of prayer and fasting, for me, maybe not for anyone else, but I'll tell you, for me, it was the most vibrant, the most powerful time in several years that I've experienced when we gather for one week for prayer every night. We got in the cafe there, and it was packed every night, and we prayed. But we also shared scriptures, and as we spoke, we kept hearing this uh, corporate word that God was giving to us. Like there was one passage or one statement that was made in the first week where we talked about a listening heart. And everyone was saying, you know, that's what we need. We need a listening heart. Another night, it had to do with uh, seeking the Lord and not just me seeking the Lord, not just me. You know, when God speaks here, he speaks to the church. 
may he speak to us as a church body. That gives me hope because sometimes I wonder, can God speak to everybody? Can he get everybody on board at one time? Wouldn't you love that if the church in America was on board, if the church in the world was on, kind of on the same level, on the same, listening? So he says here, live up to the intention of Christ and God. Be a people of unity. John, the 17th chapter. This is the prayer of Jesus and may I say this, that if you get a chance, just jot this down, go back this week sometime, read all of John 17. What a penetrating passage. What an incredible passage of Scripture. This is the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will believe in me through their message. And I pray that they will be one. Everyone say one. Just as you and I are one. What what, what a magnificent vision. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and and may be in us, so may they be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. So he didn't pray, Lord, just let them go out and build magnificent buildings, let them do mighty miracles. May they do this, may they do that, may they establish wonderful, wonderful uh, charitable organizations so that you will know. He said, no, let them be one so that the world will know. And so Jesus prayed and Paul's plea for unity. Sometimes it seems to me so completely unattainable. I started preaching when I was a teenager. And that was years ago. And I'm telling you, sometimes you can get discouraged because you wonder how much progress have we made because we see such division because we create we 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 create factions within the people of God factions that are against other opposing factions and we divide over doctrine we divide over practice our way of doing things and a myriad of other obsessions that we have and of course at fault is i think many times christian leaders because I like my group, and so I'm going to prejudice you against any other group that you may want to connect with. I'm just being honest with you today. I one time was a part of a denomination. They they just kind of, they didn't like you fellowshipping at other groups. You could lose your license by preaching in another church of another denomination really crazy. Then I come to find out that the key leaders are all up there hobnobbing with the key leaders of these other denominations. But, but what happens is, is that uh, they're, they're protecting the turf on the peon level. You know, don't do as we do, do as we say. Uh, can I use the word hogwash in church? I was preaching in one church and realized I wasn't, they could get, the pastor told me afterwards, he said, you know, uh, according to our bylaws, I'm not even supposed to have you come and and preach here. I thought, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. So we make laws, we make rules. Anyway, I don't want to down the church. Let me tell you, I'm part of the church. I'm part of the problem, but I want to be a part of the solution, right? The problem is, is that we we all think that we what we believe is right. If you don't, if you don't think I'm right, just ask me. I'll tell you. <laughs> My, uh, the guy says I give you the opportunity, the privilege, and the right to disagree with me. You have every right to be wrong. Proverbs twenty one two. Every man. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, 
but the Lord weighs the heart. So, uh, so uh, you know, this the scandal of the church, and to the observer, I, I can't defend it. I can defend the gospel. I can defend Jesus. I, I can't defend the division, the disunity, because that is not the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ is founded upon love. Isaiah 53. Some of these passages pop up to me, and that's why I give them to you, because I'm looking at the thing that Jesus paid for 2,000 years ago and a few hundred years before that, the prophet Isaiah prophesied this. He was pierced for our transgression. He was cruised for our, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep. Everybody say sheep. We're all sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, but the Lord did what? He laid the iniquity of us all on him. That word iniquity there, it doesn't just mean sin. It means lawlessness, lawlessness, rebellion. God laid our rebellion and our lawlessness on him. And so he bore all of that to the cross. Why should I live in rebellion since Jesus paid the price for my rebellion, the tremendous price that he paid for our healing, for our wholeness. It's a tremendous price that he paid for this community that is to always be in unity. There may be differences. There may be a, a cultural differences in styles of worship. They may differ, but the character of our calling is an attitude of acceptance and of love. What we do here at Christ Family Church is what we know how to do. I'm sorry, what you see is what you get. There's no, no hidden agendas or anything. I mean, we're just pretty well out there, but this is us. This is what we believe God is calling us to do, but there are other, other churches that have other emphases and other ideas and other styles of worship and so forth. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Our prayers for this community. God cannot bless us unless we're united together. So where does that unity start? It starts with me and you. It starts with us. We start and we spread it. Let me go to the second part here, the character of unity. It says, always be humble and gentle and patient with each other. <clears throat> making allowance for others' faults because of your love, because of your love. Humility, this is a quote from Bernard of Clairvaux, who, uh, Clairvaux I'm sorry, who was a, uh, a French church father. He said, it is, it is the humility is this, it's the virtue by which a man becomes conscious of his own unworthiness and in consequence of the truest knowledge of himself. Man becomes, uh, understands who he is, that he's unworthy. Remember Jesus said, after you have done the will of the Father, just say, I'm an unworthy servant. I was just doing what I was told. There's something within us that rejects this notion, at least within me, in my flesh, there's something. Because uh, I, I, I've ha gone through spells where uh, I really, I, I'm doing pretty good, you know. I, I'm somebody. It's kind of like the mouse on the back of the, of the elephant. They cross over this bridge, swaying and swaying. They get to the other side, and the, the mouse says, "Look what we did," <laughs> you know. He's just riding. But there's sometimes when we can we can be built up in our pride. To face oneself is probably the most humiliating thing in the world because most of us kind of dramatize ourselves. <laughs> we, uh, we dream dreams of, of all, ever since I was a kid, dreaming dreams. Every now and then, uh, I'm getting older now, and I, I, I can't run. I, I, I watch television. I watch them playing basketball. And, you know, I'm playing right along with them. I'm running with them. 
uh, the football, boy, they get those hits that but make a touchdown. I'm, I'm right there with them in my heart, but I can't. Just one, you know, one hit, and I would be, I'd be out. I'd be gone. They'd have to put me in the hospital. One play, and I would be in the hospital. But don't tell me that. Let me just dream it, dramatize. We self-elevate our importance many times. True humility comes when we face ourselves and our weakness and our selfishness and our failure in work and personal relationships and in achievement. I'm not talking about putting ourselves down, but humility is a self-examination and a discovery that really I'm unworthy. May God uh, help us. See, what he's saying here, he's saying, okay, church, okay, church, humble yourself. R uh, Romans, the 12th chapter, the third verse. Here's another one where he says, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you thought ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with a measure of faith that God has given to you. What is, what is the measure of your calling? Sometimes we struggle with this. I know what my calling is, but I, uh, I want yours. I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I, I want what you have. I, I know that God has given me this gift, but I don't particularly like that. I, I would rather have your gift. What is the measure of the gift that God has given to you? Be content with that. There are certain things that I can do. There are certain things that I can not do. Sometimes one... <laughs> Somebody, I think it was in high school, somebody asked Kenneth, says, is there anything that you can't do? And he said, yeah, a pull-up. He said, I can't do a, a pull-up. Meekness. Meekness is not weakness. We have a tendency to equate, you know, uh, meekness with weakness. It's not true. Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, calls Jesus a meek and lowly person. I wouldn't consider him weak. Jesus was not weak, is not weak. It is power under control. It is pliability in any circumstance. The ability to bend, the ability to, to move and sway. You know, meekness is, is kind of like when uh, uh, Barney came to Andy and said he was taking... Uh, karate, said, let me show you a move. Said, I can take you down. You probably remember. I, one of my favorite episodes. <laughs> so he comes at him. You know, he comes at Andy. Andy just makes a move or two, and he ends up on the floor. And he said, he said, you didn't oppose me the right way. You know, you didn't stand the right way. Tried it again, it didn't work. Andy, Andy didn't do much of anything. He was just, he was just meek, you know. <laughs> He just got out of the way, and he, he got all tripped up. Uh, that's what meekness many times is. It's just pliability. It's the ability to move kind of at the right time without resistance. Meekness could be described as power under control. Meekness, meekness is the person who's always angry at the right time, never angry at the wrong time. Patience is another, another description of the thing that causes unity to be. It's the character of what unity. Patience, long-suffering, the ability to endure difficult, uninvited circumstances. This is something that we all struggle with, don't we? Without losing hope or, or give, giving in to anger uh, and to being angry. A few other things here that describe it. It, it describes a spirit which will never give in and which, because it endures to the end, it will reap the reward. It's a spirit that has the power to take revenge but never does. It refuses to retaliate. retaliate. It's a spirit that, how many of you think we need a little bit of patience like that? It's a spirit that uh, bears insults and injury without bitterness, without complaint, without retaliation. 
You can't fire me, I fire you first. It's the spirit that can suffer unpleasant people with graciousness. And as one said here, and fools, uh, we can suffer fools without irritation. You got anybody that just gets on your last nerve? You know? Are you patient with that person? You know, you get into conversation with somebody and they start looking at their watch, you know you're getting, you're getting on their last nerve. Don't look at your watch. <laughs> Be patient with people. It's hard. How many of you know what I'm saying? What it, what, and when he says be, the reason why he says be patient is because it's a part of what we need to be. We need to do it. The third thing I want us to say, I'll just move on here quickly. Since that one just got a lot of amen, so I'll move on to the other one. <laughs> the work of unity or the labor of unity is a, when he says that uh, to work, that we may have peace. I love the passage here. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Every effort, effort. Well, I thought Jesus purchased all that for us. We, what, what, what's this effort thing all about? You are saved by grace through faith, but we are matured by doing things like this, making the effort, making the effort. My first verse when I was a kid, I was four years old. My mother was my Sunday school teacher, and she taught us the Beatitudes. And, and, the, and she, the, she would tell us, these are the Beatitudes. The attitudes are attitudes that are part of your being. You ought to be this. It, that has nothing to do with that word, actually, the root form of that word. It's okay. But one of them was, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When I was four years old, I lost not just the two front teeth, I lost the, the four front teeth. Though I talked like this all the time. Though I memoized that particular book. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And they loved it so much, they got me in front of the church to tell everybody. And the pastor would say, say it again, Paul, say it again. <laughs> and they laughed. I thought they were just admiring my ability to memorize. They were actually in a kind way making fun of me. But they loved to hear me say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I had no idea that that would become a core part of my life. Blessed are the peacemakers. Why did Jesus say blessed are the peacemakers? Just the, reason, the same reason he said blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are those who thirst. These are normally negative things, hungering and thirsting and being poor in spirit. These are kind of the negative put-downs. Well, guess what? Being a peacemaker is too. There's sometimes like I'm, 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 I'm like Tavier, I'm the fiddler on the roof. Lord, if I'm called to this, would you please call somebody else for a change? Because, uh, you know, I find myself and have over the years in the position of being not a peacekeeper. He didn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. He says blessed are the peacemakers, people who make peace. I had a couple of pastor friends. One was a better friend than the other, and I knew him more. And we're at this meeting, and they kind of got into an argument. Sorry, but pastors can be stupid too. And so they got in this argument, and Jim was over here. I forgot this guy's name, but you know, I'll call him Fred. I hope there's not a Fred here. It was Jim and Fred. And uh, Jim was is a retired, he's a, this is no joke. I mean, he's a pastor, but he's a retired Marine sergeant, a drill sergeant from the Marines. And he still had the build, you know, and he was tough. He was just kind of a tough, kind of a, a brash guy. And this guy here, he's kind of a little bit more milk toast, but they, they, they could argue. And they're arguing over the Holy Spirit. 
And this one said to Jim, you don't have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not given after the apostles. You can't do this, you can't do that because it all ended with the apostles and I forget what the argument was. I just remember with Jim said, you better be glad I have the Holy Spirit or I would stomp your doo-doo in the ground. <laughs> and I'm, thinking, I'm sitting here like, you know, like I'm at a tennis match back and forth as they throw, throw insults back and forth to each other. Finally, I had to play referee and, uh, and make peace. And I got him. You know, before it was over with, I like sometimes I've done in marriage counseling, okay, y'all hug and make up. I, I made him hug, didn't make him kiss, but I made him hug, you know, right there. You guys need to, need to not do this. This is not good, especially out here. And we're at a kind of a hotel ballroom outside the ballroom at a table where people can see what's going on. So out there arguing, you know, right in front of God and everybody. And God has called us to be peacemaker, called me to be a peace. And every now and then I said, Lord, could I just be, could I be over here <laughs> or over here sometime? Why am I in the middle here? I'm sure I have been. Uh, Delia is a wonderful peacemaker. I'm grateful for that. So God called us to be peacemakers. So James, the third chapter, says, If you harbor bitter and envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it. You know, if you think you're right all the time, don't boast about it. Deny the truth. Verse 15, such wisdom, in quotes here, does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. That word wisdom there literally means that force, that force. This thing has got power, but it doesn't come from above. It comes from below. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. Then peace-loving. Everyone say peace-loving. Man, that, that's the wisdom. Peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers, then, who sow in peace, raise a harvest of righteousness. People who sow peace get the reward of that. Peacemakers are not peacekeepers. And, you know, people of peace get a bad rap nowadays because if, if you're not just uh, breathing fire about something of some position, you're accused of being a kind of a pathetic navel gazer. You don't believe anything. No, you know, just neutral, doesn't believe anything. There's division, hatred all going on. What do you, where do you stand? You try to present it to somebody, oh, you just don't believe anything. Let me just tell you this, that loving your enemies is not navel-gazing. It's the bravest, the hardest, the most difficult, the most challenging thing that you will ever do. To pick a position and, to, and, and, and then to, to air it on social media and all of that doesn't take a whole lot of anything. There I said it, I got it out there. Somebody told me one time, well, I, you, this is just the way I believe. You're just going to have to put up with it. And I'm thinking, no, I don't really have to put up with it. Peacemakers are not neutral. There's a difference in being neutral and impartial. The referee is certainly not neutral, but he's impartial. But he's paid to be impartial. He makes, comes to a conclusion he makes the decision. He is conclusive. Believers are conclusive. They build bridges. They don't burn them. Let me just close with this on the power of unity because it's a very simple passage here, the last passage, part of this passage. And this is the reason why, why there has to be unity and why Jesus wants unity. And... The, the, the labor of unity that I have spoken of lets us to know that this is something that we do work for. 
It doesn't automatically happen all the time. Sometimes you automatically love somebody. Sometimes you don't automatically love somebody. Now, Helen came in this morning. Everybody automatically loves Helen. Anybody to put up with Chris. We love Helen. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. We love Helen. Some people, they've got that smile. They've got that winsome look. They've got... They just, they just, they embrace you, and uh, but not everybody is lovable. But here's what he says: We are one body. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you make up the body. Body meets in different locations, different places, but we're we're one body. There's only one spirit, the Holy Spirit. One spirit in all of us. One, one, one spirit. Not two spirit, one. One hope. We, we're all aiming for the same thing. One Lord. Can I hear an amen? Is <laughs> Jesus. The Bible says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. One faith. Different doctrines, different attitudes, different ideas, rather, different approaches different interpretations sometimes, but only one faith. And that faith is Jesus Christ. One baptism by one spirit, we've been baptized into the same body. I shared the other night, there's somebody that, uh, that I see on TV uh, every now and then, and I, I, I always flip it. Well, I don't flip TV anymore. We don't have TV. We've got we get our news on YouTube. I guess that's our main thing. I just don't even look because this person really grates me. You, you, anybody here? Do you have anybody that kind of gets under your last nerve? You know, so. And you know what? I was thinking uh, like that. I'm, I'm just, I'm, da, da. and the Lord spoke to me and said, that person is my child. Ouch. Ouch. That's God. How much does God love them? How much? That person that you hate, how much does God love that person? That person that you detest, that you can't stand, that you just don't, how much does God love? I couldn't be God, could you? I just couldn't be God. One baptism, we're all baptized, and then one God, Father of all. Let's go back to the passage of Jesus' prayer. I am praying not only for these disciples, but all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one. Everyone say one, just as you and I are one. You are in me, Father, and I am in you. May they be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Amen. Let's stand and pray together. We're one, right? <laughs> if you're comfortable, do this. Ho hook up with somebody. Just take somebody's hand. If you're uncomfortable doing that, you don't know anybody, um, just uh, get, look at them like you love them anyway. Let's pray. Let's pray for each other. <laughs> Lord, we, we have this calling. You've called us. You've called us to be your people, to be united with you, and to be united with each other, and we thank you for that. Lord, I've, uh, I know I, I, so many times I have failed. I haven't loved like you love. I haven't cared for others like you care for them. And I'm asking you, Lord God, forgive me and show me the right way to do that. Lord, our church, we, we, we have failed many times. We failed to bless people and to care for people and to show how much we love them. Lord, may we just uh, be the kind of people today that, that are constantly loving and reaching out to people, that we care, showing that we care. 
and not just showing so that we may be able to win them over, but just as an end within itself, caring for the people of our community. I lift up the areas around us here in Northwest Houston. Lord, would you cause us to be agents of your love and of your grace? We ask you for that. And if there's someone here today, someone listening right now, you've never taken your life and given it to him. You've never said to Jesus, Lord, you are the Lord of my life and I am going to give my life to you. And I need you. Would you do that right now? Just pray this prayer, a simple prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for all that you've done for me. And I thank you for preserving me to this point. Thank you for dying for my sins. I give my life to you. Come, live within me and live through me. And let me be a part of your community, your people. Let me be a part of your family. If you pray that prayer, God hears that prayer. And he will answer that prayer. And he will do exactly that the very moment that you put your faith and your trust in him. We give you the glory. We give you the honor and the praise for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Could we worship the Lord for a, a few moments together? When you move in power, a miracle. 